coffee break, the randomized coffee trial, I think it was. Thank you so much for arranging that. Um, welcome to the, hi to the people who are tuning in as well. But it's my pleasure to, my name is Jasmine, and it's my pleasure to introduce Adrian Cut, our first speaker for our first paper session for Sismus 17. He's a second year PhD student at Queen Mary, and he's investigating using models of symbolic music to improve automatic music transcription. So, um, paper is going to focus on the training process of the um, neural model of neural network models. So um, with, without further ado, let me, let me bring Adrian up. Thank you very much. <laughs> so hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here and be the first of this first paper session while everyone is still fresh. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Digital Music and today I'm going to present some work that I have been doing on the neural music language model and more specifically the training process of that neural network. So first I'm going to give you a bit more context about what I'm doing in my PhD. I'm working on automatic music transcription, so that means extracting from an audio signal a symbolic representation saying what notes were played at what time, basically, typically in the form of a piano roll. And in that area, I'm developing music language models. So to help you understand what I mean by that, I'm going to draw a parallel between music and uh, speech. So in speech transcription, uh, you have an acoustic model that extracts phonemes from an audio recording. And then you have a language model that uses higher level um, symbolic information about the language to link those phonemes into meaningful sentences. And in music, the workflow is basically the same. You have an acoustic model that extracts uh, frame-wise pitches uh, estimations. And then you have a language model that uses higher level information uh, to link those frame-wise estimations into a meaningful piano roll. So that's what I'm focusing on, and I'm doing that using neural networks. So that's what I call by a neural music language model. And um, in that talk, I'm going to focus on the training process. Uh, rather on, than on the architecture, because very often people that uh, use neural networks for music are people from machine learning. So they use very sophisticated architectures, but they don't always make musically motivated choices. So I'm trying to take the other path. And so I'm using a very simple single layer uh, LSTM network. So LSTM is a kind of recurrent neural network that is tremendously popular. It's basically the default now. Um, and so I'm going to try various things, in particular using musically relevant time steps, using various data augmentation techniques, and trying pre-training the networks with uh, simple th synthetic files. Uh, the idea behind that being that when you learn music theory, you start with scales, with chords, with simple stuff, and then you move on, you move on to more complicated stuff. Um, so I'm going to evaluate my models on a prediction task, simply because in natural language processing, uh, usually the language models are evaluated on a prediction task. So basically I have a polyphonic music sequence and I want to know what comes next. And the data that I'm going to use are piano rolls. So it's matrices um, with 88 rows and T uh, columns for T time steps. And um, there is a one in that matrix if a given pitch is active at a given time step. So this is what a piano roll looks like. Um, and so the task here is given uh, the beginning of the matrix, we want to predict the next column. Uh, to do so, I'm going to use a data set that some of you might know. It's the Piano MIDI data set. It contains uh, classical piano pieces from a wide range of composers and epochs. And uh, the nice thing about this data set is that it has both a natural interpretation available and the rhythmic ground truth also available. Um, and this is going to be important for the first experiment that I'm going to present, where I compare time-based time steps and note-based time steps. I'm also going to present other experiments, the, first one, uh, the second one, so, on data augmentation. Data augmentation is uh, simply the idea that you can get a bigger data set by making um, transformation on the data that you already have. Uh, I'm also going to try pre-training my network with uh, simple sequences and I'm going to present a case study where I compare two networks, one trained on classical music and another on romantic music. 
uh, to evaluate those networks, there are two different methods. The first one is to compute the cross-entropy between the output of the network and the ground truth. And the second one is to take the output of the network, which is real values between zero and one, you threshold it to get a binary piano roll, and then you compare that binary piano roll to your ground truth using like precision, recall, F measure, the, the type of stuff. But it turns out that those two methods are actually strongly correlated, so I'm only going to keep F measure as a way of evaluating the network. So let's start with the first experiment. Uh, I compared two uh, different time steps. The first one, which is of fixed length in seconds, 10 milliseconds, and the second one, uh, which is a fixed musical length, so a 16th note, but it can vary depending on the tempo. And what I observe is that uh, I have a much better prediction performance with the time-based time steps on the left than with the note-based time steps on the right. But uh, the reason for that is that with the time-based time steps, since the time step is so small compared to the typical duration of a note, you mostly have self-transitions. So that means that the network simply learns to repeat the pitches that are already active. So that's a perfectly fine strategy in this case. It works well. Uh, but it's not satisfying from a music modeling point of view. On the other hand, the note-based time steps show much more interesting properties. For instance, uh, you see that every few time steps, actually every four time steps, so every beat, uh, instead of continuing the active note, uh, the network gives a small probability to other notes, so that means that it knows that every beat the note might change, which is very sensible. Uh, plus, it doesn't change to any note. It only changes to notes that are in the right scale. So it also shows that it has learned some kind of tonality. All of this is very interesting. So from now on, I'm only going to talk about node-based uh, networks and not time-based networks. Um, I tried uh, to augment my data set by simply taking every piece and um, uh, transposing it in every key. So that expands the data set 12 folds. And without surprise, the data was much, uh, the network was much better with data augmentation than without. Um, just to be sure, I uh, tried to, um, I tried to just take the, the data set without data augmentation, but train 12 times as much. And uh, in this case, I have seen that the, de the network was overfit. So that means that it was very good on the training data, but very bad on the test data. Uh, I also time to time stretch all my pieces uh, in my um, in my data set, but in this case the results were not really improved. I tried various experiments and either the results were the same or they were worse. I think the main reason for that is that since I used note-based time steps, the time step already carry a lot of uh, musical rhythmic uh, information. So if you mess up with that temporal structure. Um, instead of helping the network generalize, uh, you actually mislead it, so you get worse results. So I tried also to pre-train my network. Basically, I generated some simple sequ sequences of chords. Um, I trained my network for a few epochs with that simple data, and then I retrained it with the real data. And the results that I got, at first they were encouraging, but when I repeated those experiments to see if it was just not just a lucky result, uh, actually, at first it was. So um, on average, uh, the results are not really improved, but since you have a bigger variance, you can get better results, but you can also get much worse results. So I think the, res the reason why it didn't really work is that the pre-training data that I use is too far away from the real data that I use. So the learning didn't really, really transfer. So now I'm going to show a case study uh, where I compare classically trained models and romantically trained models. So I make two hypotheses. The first one is that classical music is better explained by classically trained models than romantic trained models, and vice versa for romantic music. The second hypothesis is uh, concerns Beethoven's music. So Beethoven was not included either in the classic trained set or the romantic trained set. So I want to see if his work is better explained by romantic music or classic music classical music, and in particular if his early pieces are more classical and his late pieces are more romantic. So for the first hypothesis, uh, it is true. So uh, the, the classic test set was better explained by the classically trained model than the romantic trained model, and the other way around for the romantic test set. 
And we also see that the romantic test set is overall better explained by both models than the classic, uh, classical test set. I think the reason for that is that the classic test set uh, contains a lot of studies uh, by Clementi and those studies have a lot of very short notes which are very badly predicted by the network. It's much better at predicting long notes. Um, for the other uh, hypotheses concerning Beethoven's, uh, it wasn't really verified. So uh, actually Beethoven's music is overall better explained by the romantic model than the classical model. And I think the reason for that is that overall the romantic model is better. So I tried to test my two models on other data sets that had nothing to do with romantic music or anything. And overall the romantic model was always better. I think the reason for that is that um, in the romantic test set, it will, uh, there was much more diverse data, so there was more pieces and more composers, even though the overall length was the same. So I think it's better at generalizing. So, uh, in this talk I presented the work that I've been doing on training a neural music language model. I have shown that time-based time step give a better prediction performance, but node-based time step are more interesting models. Uh, data augmentation, some techniques work, some don't. Uh, Pre-training didn't really work the way I did it, but probably gonna do more experiments. And style seems to be somewhat captured by the network since it can discriminate between two different datasets. Now the perspective, like the future work that I could do. Well, the first thing that we can say from this work is that uh, prediction performance is not a good indicator of the quality of the model. That's a big problem because now I don't know how to evaluate my model, so if you have ideas, very welcome. Um, I could also use uh, other kind of input representations, so I used a simple frame-based representation, I could have used other frame-based representations or note-based representation where each element is represented by its speech and its duration. Uh, I could also try more parameters on the network using more sophisticated uh, network architectures. And ultimately, since the goal of uh, the project is to improve automatic music transcription, I will have to combine my language model with some acoustic models and see how it can improve automatic music transcription. Thank you very much. I think there will be quite a few interesting. I really enjoyed how you can your studies can span all the way into musicology. So yes, any questions? Hello, thank you very much for the lecture, very interesting. Um, I, if I understood well, you use it um, preset data, right? Or you know, it's a, a data for, of well-known performances? Or um, Actually, the, the data set, the way uh, it was made is actually quite funny. It's a guy that took quantized um, MIDI files, so basically score translated into a MIDI file, and he carefully edited all the velocities and the tempo track in order to give a natural interpretation. But it's not someone that performed the pieces. It's mm -hmm. a guy that manually edited the tracks in order to make them sound natural. So my question is, uh, would you be interested, for example, to record um, using a digital piano, for example, and a piano, a romantic or classical piano pieces, and then and make this study um, under this data that is from real people playing? Yeah, that, that would be interesting. The problem is that I, for my note-based time steps, since the time step is of a 16th note, I need a good tempo tracking. So I need to have the beat and I have basically to have the rhythmic ground truth. So that's the only problem that I would have with uh, real performances. If the, I don't know, if, if if we had reliable beat tracking methods or tempo estimation methods, I could do that, but they're not reliable enough for this work. 
Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask whether it would be possible to combine those two data sets, the one of classical and the one of romantic scenes. You said the classical wasn't that representative of the style. Maybe having a more extended data set would help your results. So uh, for the first set of experiments that I presented, not the case study, uh, the data set that I used uh, contained all kinds of music, so romantic music, classical music, impressionist music, like a wide range of uh, piano pieces. It's only for the case study that I took two different data sets because I wanted to see if style could somewhat be encoded in the network. But uh, yeah, definitely having more diverse data clearly improves the results. Yeah, so probably maybe the, the style wasn't that different in the end, since the Romantic had more, more significant results than the classical. It's more of a unify, more unified style of music. Um, I don't know. I, honestly, I think that the, the reason why the Romantic train model was better is because the Romantic data set was better. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, there were more pieces, shorter pieces, but more pieces, so more diverse data. While for the classic training data set, uh, it had, for example, symphonies by Mozart where it, it's really long and it's often the same thing. So the network doesn't get to see very different things and is worse at generalizing. Thank you for your input. Thank you very much. That's all the questions we have time for. Thank you. We're very interested.